Okay, we're good to go, Nicole. Okay, okay. I'll get started. Okay. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Nourish the Soul, Nicole. So we're very, very glad to have yet another episode of the On a Mission series where we have very, very interesting and spirit-filled conversations with uh, people who are actively pursuing the mission in a very unique way. And I think you can hear that I'm getting very excited because uh, I'm very, very pleased to have Father Stephen with us here on the podcast today. I haven't, I think, caught up with Father Stephen for a very long time, but just a little bit of background. Uh, he was uh, my chaplain back in Newman House, back in London, when I was studying there a couple of years ago. And I'm very, very uh, thankful to have this time to really have a conversation with him. So, you know, I've been actually looking on Facebook recently, and there's been lots of um, amazing videos, right? amazing uh, articles that have been done by Father Stephen. So I thought this would be a great time to catch up uh, with Father Stephen. And I just want to say hi to Father Stephen. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, how you discern you know, your vocation to the priesthood and all of these like really interesting things that you have been up to, you know, since we, since we last spoke. Great, great. Look, first of all, Nicole, it's great to see you again. We we shared our life in this community here. Was it, were you here for one or two years? I can't remember. I think it was two years. I think. Two years, yes. Yeah. So just, it's lovely to see you again. And I'm so happy that you're back home and working and that you're doing all these wonderful podcast projects as well. Um, so look, as you know, I'm sitting here in the, the chap university chaplaincy in London. I'm a diocesan priest in the Diocese of Westminster in central London. So just my normal life is working with university students and that's, that's how I got to know Nicole. Um, but you're asking that big question about discernment and mission and, and especially the priesthood. So let me try and answer that in, in not too long, in two or three minutes. Um, I think you've probably heard me say this before, Nicole, that I didn't grow up Catholic. So I grew up in a Christian family with very strong Christian background. But in fact, by the time I went to, to high school, senior school, I, I didn't have any living faith. I wasn't, I would have called myself an atheist, I think, didn't go to church. So, so a big thing for me was discovering Christianity, discovering the Catholic church, um, coming to know the Lord and becoming a Catholic um, age 19 through friends and, and other wonderful people I knew and reading and praying and just a fantastic time. But then it meant when I went to university, I was a new Catholic and I had didn't have a clue about jobs or career or vocation. And honestly, at the beginning at 19, I wasn't thinking about it very much at all. But I think it was at the end of university, uh, that last year of university and the year afterwards, when I was thinking as you, as you do about what does, what's, where's my life going and how am I going to earn a living? And, and yes, what, what does God want me to do and what's on my heart? Um, and I think for me, the discernment about my vocation and priesthood, it was a gradual thing. It wasn't, it wasn't a light bulb going off um, and everything coming together suddenly. Um, it was, it was realizing that the things that were on my heart more and more. So just for example, on my heart, um, just I had a real longing to share the faith. I was always getting into conversations with people about God and, and prayer and life and the meaning of life. And um, just, I guess I had a missionary heart, even though I wouldn't have, have used that language and wanting to talk and, and share the faith with people. I was, I was just an ordinary student saying my prayers in the morning, but I felt a real call more and more to prayer. And I found myself going off to the, to the chaplaincy. Um, it wasn't residential, but, but going into the chapel of the university chaplaincy before lectures, just to have some prayer time. And I know that doesn't mean you're going to become a priest just because you want to pray because lay people <laughs> pray. But just for me, it felt like a call to, to deepen prayer and to deepen my prayer for other people and wanting to pray with other people and seeing the attraction, the beauty of the mass and hearing confessions. Um, so there was, there was a pull to prayer and, and helping others to pray and leading others in prayer. And I guess the other big thing was just, I got to know at university some, some really wonderful priests. My, 
My main university chaplain was a Benedictine. There was a diocesan priest on the team. We had the Dominicans living up the road coming in to give talks. I got to know one or two Franciscans and Jesuits and my parish priest at home. And just, I, I had some wonderful examples of, of priesthood, men of real faith, and, and joy with, with such a big heart for the Lord and full of kindness to me and to, to the other students I knew. So it, I'd say over, over quite a time, maybe about two years, it was the longing to, to, to preach and teach, the longing to lead others in prayer and the sacraments and the example of priests, so that finally, as it were, the penny dropped and I thought, well, this is what priests do. The, the, the things that are on my heart are the things that priests do, and maybe God wants me to be a priest. So, so that was coming to a bit of clarity there. Um, and then the, the last piece of the puzzle was, because I knew the Dominicans so well, I, have, I had a great love for the Dominicans and their, their academic life and their teaching, and I was really torn and, and, and speaking to them a lot. I went on a vocations retreat with the Dominicans and I, I'm not exaggerating. I literally, for about a month, I had the application form to join the Dominicans on my desk as I was finishing my studies and, and very nearly signed it. And, and just at the last minute, talking to some friends and praying, just I came to some clarity that in fact, for me, it was not to be I, I can't find a better way of putting it. I just felt a call to be an ordinary priest, to, to be just a priest. Yeah, not to be, in other words, a Dominican priest, a religious priest, a priest who lived in a monastery, in a community, a, a priest who had this spirituality, but, but just to be an ordinary priest and to be really open to whatever God wanted and, and not to get into a particular niche of I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. You know, it was the idea of, in one sense, it didn't matter whether I was in a parish or a prison or a hospital or a university, just just to be a loving priest for the, for the wherever God sent me. And I think that's at the heart of diocesan priesthood. So in the end, um, I felt really it was a mixture of, it's all the same really, but it was what God had put on my heart and what I felt God was calling me to. In other words, my own heart and, and the idea of vocation, the, the inner vocation and the outward vocation, they came together in terms of, of diocesan priesthood. Um, and, and in terms of the, the choosing and the discerning, that felt like coming to a conclusion. But of course, then I had to put the application form in and go to seminary. And, but just I'd say that's a, that's a summary of how I ended up going from atheism to Christianity, to the Catholic Church, and to the idea of the diocesan priesthood as being what was what was God's call for me. I think that's very, very, uh, very beautiful uh, what you shared, Father Stephen, about how you always wanted to share the faith. Uh, you always wanted to have conversations with people uh, and really engage with people. And I really remember that, I think, about you uh, when I was in Newman House. Uh, you always able to strike up a conversation with just about anyone and you always ask us like you know how we are you know how it's school and everything and I think that really established like a very strong sense of I think connection with the rest of us right all of us were like university students you know we're trying to um, sometimes we make mistakes you know and it's and it's a very interesting tumultuous time I think for us I think but you were I think a very important calming presence for a lot of us as we always know that we can turn to you and I think that's also what Jesus hopes for us to uh, come to him, right? To really like be able to come to him at any time, even when we also feel like very stressed or anxious, like, we, like he should be the first person uh, that we think of, right, to, to turn to. And I think for a lot of us, like, you know, we always feel that we can talk to you, I think, Father Stephen, uh, you know, when we're, when we're going through problems and issues and, you know, it's, it's a very safe space, I think, also that you can create, you know, in terms of like engaging people um, in conversation. And I really see that in all the amazing stuff that I see on the Facebook page. I'm like, wow, Father Stephen is just creating lots of, you know, amazing Catholic uh, content, you know, like you have a pause for faith channel. I've seen your Sycamore shots and I've been sharing it with like so many of my friends and we just love 
everything that is, is coming out. And we're just amazed at like your energy. Really, it's like, you know, where is this energy coming from? Okay, maybe it's because like, you know, all of us are working adults are like, oh, we're always complaining about, oh, we're very tired. You know, it's a very difficult time. There's uh, work deadlines and everything. But, but then we, when we look at all of the content that you're putting out, you always have like so much energy. Like you have so much enthusiasm and passion. And I, and I really would love to like know more about, you know, you know, where all of this, you know, ideas came from, you know, what led you from, mm-hmm. as you were saying, you know, to the priesthood, you know, to you, um, you know, caring for the needs, I think, of, of university students like myself last time. And now you're like, wow, you know, really, really, um, really, really moving into this really missionary spirit, as we we're saying just now, mm. you know, like really going out on mission. So like really, wow, how maybe you can share with us a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, thank you for what you said, Nicole. And thank God that he's blessing us in different ways. And I'm grateful to God that some of the things I've been doing and we've been doing here at the chaplaincy have been helpful and and fruitful and just praise the Lord that he's working in so many different ways. Um, I think think it's nice to have this conversation because I do think there is a thread, a very simple one with, I haven't quite thought about this before, but you've asked me to speak about the beginnings of vocation and now you're asking me about my current work. And I think there probably is a thread which, which isn't complicated, you know. Um, I think in one sense, it's nothing to do with me. It's just Christianity. It, it's John Vianney, St. John Vianney, wasn't it? He said, at the heart, uh, our, we are made to, to love God and to love our neighbour. In other words, we are made for for prayer and for love. And and that's true for every one of us. And and yes, as I was thinking about the the call to priesthood, then I think very much on my heart has been it's just the kind of my character, I guess. I love being with people so that everyone's different. But just I love people and I love being with people. I love talking about things and what's important, what's interesting. So just in terms of the kind of personality I am, that was a starting point. And then in terms of priesthood, I think it it has meant that that one of the things that's important for every Christian and for every priest, and yes, for me, is is a desire to be with others, to to share one's life with others. And I, I do think this goes back to the call for me to diocesan priesthood, because the diocesan priesthood, another term for it is is the secular priesthood now sometimes people say that's a slightly odd thing secular doesn't that mean worldly and and anti-god but no the word secular first of all it means being in the world it means it means living closely with others and I think the diocesan priest wants to be with people to pray with people to talk to people to share their lives and and just to be part of a community whether that's the parish whether it's the chaplaincy as you said so I think the Lord has put onto my priestly heart as a kind of constant, some, some very ordinary, simple things, a, a longing to be with others, to share their lives, to speak about faith, to help them to grow in faith, um, and to try and do that in whatever way seems to be appropriate at the time. So, so this isn't complicated. So when I was in a in working in a parish in North London for four years, what did that mean? It meant just getting on with the ordinary things of parish life. You know, we didn't have the internet then. We didn't have um, Facebook and social media and YouTube. So being close to people, it meant visiting people's homes and and running groups in the parish and and visiting the schools and and going to visit the sick and the the elderly in their homes and in the hospitals. This is just the wonderful ordinary life of a priest is is being close to people as a brother, as a priest, as a a spiritual father. And then in seminary, when I was teaching in the seminary in in Chelsea, in our our seminary in Allen Hall, the focus of that that love, if you like, it was to be with the students and the seminarians and and to be a brother and a teacher and a, a mentor to them. So finally, to answer your question, here in the university chaplaincy, it, it's, it's been to try and live that, that same life, but in the circumstances of university. And pre-COVID, that meant the incredible gift of, of 
being able to have our chaplaincy centre at Newman House, which was a home for anyone and everyone. And you remember, Nicole, the incredible mm -hmm. prayer and conversations and meals that we would have. Um, but it also means being able to go out onto campus. Um, I'm the university chaplain at LSE, the London School of Economics, and we've got chaplains on campuses and we're working with the student Catholic groups. So, so the priesthood, I would say, it's remained the same for me, but it's just taken a different shape mm. in each place. And then clearly the importance more and more of, of social media and, and video and, and different ways of connecting with people. So I think some of this has been on my heart personally. You know, I just, I just believe we, we should be using every way possible of, of connecting and reaching out to other people and, and sharing our faith and, and being close to others. Um, but some of this has happened providentially, I would say. In other words, I think it, it's not been part of my plan. Um, so just I've been asked to help out with one or two things. A wonderful project we had in England called Catholic Voices. And it's, it's 10 years old now, so it's nothing to do with COVID. It, it was just a project <laughs> to try and help ordinary Catholic lay people to be more involved in the media and more um, happy to be on the media, exactly like you're doing now, Nicole. You know, you're, you're an ordinary and I mean that in the best sense, you're a wonderful ordinary young laywoman thinking I want to try and be present in the media and to support my friends and other young people and you've, you've taken the risk of doing it, so congratulations. But that's what Catholic Voices were doing, was doing for 10 years and they, I, I knew the two founders, the three founders, and they just asked me to be the chaplain and to support them in that, so that meant that I was having to think a lot more back then about media. Um, and then you've mentioned Sycamore. That's a project that's certainly not just me, it's grown out of the life of the chaplaincy here. We had a, an evan you remember this, we had an evangelization course that we were running, a program and an in introduction to Christianity. And we thought, why don't we film that? Why don't we make that available online and share it with other universities and other parishes? So that's grown and grown so that now we have this, this wonderful program of, of evangelization and, and catechesis and faith formation, some great films, but it's more than just the films, it's to try and encourage people to, to start groups, to share these films with others, to get discussions going and to try and give people the tools they need so that they can share their faith locally in their parishes and their chaplaincies. So that's definitely something that's grown out of my life as a university chaplain. And the pause for faith, I, I think, I mean, that's COVID really. So, you know, that, that was definitely not a plan at all. Um, I'd never done any live streaming. Um, I'd done a lot of media work, but, but no live streaming. And I just felt very much in the first lockdown. And I think this probably was something from the Holy Spirit. Um, just felt that the need in that really difficult time of lockdown was not just for good content, you know, not just, oh, there's some great video online. Well, there is some great video. You, we, in one sense, we don't need more videos. There's, there's thousands of great Catholic videos. But I felt that in lockdown, the need was for the live connection, you know, to the sense of I'm stuck at home, I can't go to church maybe, or I'm isolating because I'm elderly and, and just if only I could connect with, with, with someone, with a community of people who are praying together um, and have a sense of community and belonging and, and going through this together. And I think this is not me at all. There have been loads of examples of this, haven't there, of, of how various um, live streams have, have started up and um, interactive groups and, and Zoom and now, we can get a bit too much of this, I know, but just that that was my my instinct back in, in March, April last year. And that was why I started Pause for Faith. First of all, it was just to be a daily live stream so that people had, had something they could connect to each day. Um, but then unexpectedly, really, honestly, it, it became then a video library because YouTube archives the live streams. Oh. And that wasn't part of the plan but it ended up that, that the archive videos, the library was getting a lot more 
use use than than the live stream. So the live streaming led me to creating the videos for the video library, which are now being used in in ways I didn't plan and I wasn't expecting at the beginning. So it just yeah, it's funny how things work out and, and how God works. But no, there's a little bit of of, of sharing, Nicole, about chaplaincy and, and sycamore and pause for faith but we we can talk about any of the details if you want to yeah it's really i i really felt um very actually inspired by what you said about like using all of the tools available to us uh in terms of like this new era of evangelization but i i really really uh, find it very beautiful that you started with like your diocesan priesthood and how you connect it with people so i think like the trait that you, you are talking about actually is like this desire for connection with God's people and to really see people, you know, as they are in their hour of need and what do they need uh, most importantly at that point in time of their life, you know, like, you know, this person uh, needs food, this person needs shelter. And then yeah. what you actually viewed in terms of the pandemic era is that people need connection, mm. right? People need to know that there are other people on the other side of the line. I'm, I'm sure that after a while, Zoom and everything is just, it's kind of tiring. It's kind of, uh, it's quite exhausting, but some people really need that connection. They need that reminder, right? And yeah. I think even for, for for us, I think here in Singapore, we also have like a 24-hour perpetual adoration. Mm. So it's like a live stream of the Blessed Sacrament. And we never really thought of that idea. Like, you know, usually we'll just go to a chapel and then we'll pray in the adoration room. And then now, like, you know, that that kind of like yeah, reminded me of that that idea about the fact that that the Lord is always fully present. Yeah. Right. And yeah, sometimes people need that that reminder because I think in the pandemic a lot of people felt very intense, like loneliness and isolation. Yeah. Right. And you know, just being able to know that they can log on at a particular time to see your pause for faith videos, I think it really brought a lot of like consolation. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a lot of um support. People felt like you know, it's like an invisible kind of like support also, like, even though you can't be with them physically, yeah. they can still experience God. I think through you know through your videos and it's so interesting how you said that they archive the videos yeah uh, so you have like, a library uh you know you didn't i think you, you said you didn't like really um intend to do that right to create a library per se but because it archives now now everyone can go back and you know look at all of the videos so it's like uh, this like growing re repository right of of all of these these videos that you've done and i think yeah. that yeah it, it really has reach so many people because we don't really know when we are on these platforms right how many people are reading it how many people are watching it and we don't even know like who's listening sometimes yeah but i think yeah we the important thing is that someone is listening and i think someone is experiencing god through whatever we are saying or doing so i think that yeah that really is a beautiful reminder yeah yeah, yeah. i don't i think we're, we're always finding new ways but i think the fundamentals of Christianity don't change. And that's what every generation experiences, isn't it? We know the fundamentals don't change, but we're always trying to find new ways to, to live them out. And, and the last year of, of COVID have been a, an example of that. We know we need community, but when you can't go to church and you can't join a prayer group or a Bible study group, or you can't even meet friends. How do we find community in, in new ways? Um, we know we need prayer and the sacraments, but when you can't go to church or you can't meet to pray, how, how do you find prayer in a new way? So I think part of the last year for all of us has been trying to find new ways to do old things and, and to try and be be brave and creative and to take risks in doing that and you know really really be creative but on the other hand some of the experience of the last year for all of us in different ways has been realizing that there were important things that we didn't know we needed before i think you know for example um Everyone's talking about connecting now and, and, and loneliness. Well, the fact is pe people were lonely and disconnected before COVID. You know, it's not that we lived in a perfect world and then COVID ruined it. Um, just to take the church as an example, the, the, how many Catholics, even before COVID, didn't have really a strong experience of community or friendship or, 
or knowing other Catholics or being able to support one another. It is something I've been very conscious of as a priest. You've heard me going on and on about it at the chaplaincy, about our responsibility to care for others. But just living the Christian faith is, is not always easy. And, and even before COVID and after COVID, it is a challenge because so many Christians do feel isolated. So, so for, for all of us to be thinking, how can we be more open to others? How, how can we just be more loving basically, but also what, what things can we put in place so that people will have opportunities to share and support one another and, and just, just to be constantly creative and learning. And I guess one of the things in, in the background for me about this, this need for creativity, um, or two actually, two, two of the things that have really formed me, one is the Young Christian Workers and the other is the St Vincent de Paul Society. They're, they're very different groups but they're really well established Catholic groups and at the heart of both of them, they've got this idea that you need to, to take stock and, and review the real human and spiritual needs of the people in your local areas. In other words, you must be careful, on the one hand, not to get complacent and ignore what's in front of your own ideas. And on the other hand, you must be careful not just to apply some global solution top down, thinking that it will be relevant to your own situation. You have to really look carefully. What's the needs of the people around you? Um, in your case, the young people of Singapore. In my case, the university chaplaincy situation, the situation in London. So the young Christian workers would use the language of see, judge, act. You need to, to see and look carefully. You need to, to make a good judgment, not, not as in condemn, but you know, a, a discernment about what is truly needed. And then you must act, put it into practice. See, judge, act. And the St. Vincent de Paul Society, that the language they use is to do a local audit. You know, it sounds a bit bureaucratic, mm -hmm. but it's a fantastic word, really. You, you must audit, you must, you must sit down and reflect and listen and look and see what's really going on, what's really needed, and what you, as, as maybe a very little limited group of people, what can you actually do that will make a difference? So just, I, I recommend to people if they don't know much about the Young Christian Workers or the St Vincent de Paul Society to find out about them. It might be you want to start YCW or SVP groups in your own parish, that would be great, but just to, to learn from their wonderful methodology about trying to be open and, and to try and be creative and, and not to be afraid of doing something new. I think that's um, a very, very good piece of advice, Father Stephen, I think because like sometimes, you know, in the, in the spirit of evangelization, I think we sometimes forget about the importance of like looking at our local situation and how we can improve it right because if not like we'll kind of become a little bit like you know we're preaching the word we're telling people to do certain things but we also need to act up right and we need yeah. to yeah, catalyze that change because i think you know there's a lot of um, people right that want to help right they have a desire to help but sometimes we also have to take a as you were saying an audit right do a local audit and to check what are the needs, right? Because mm. sometimes we have these preconceived notions that we know what people need. Oh, you know, uh, this person needs this, you know, this community needs this, and this is how I'm going to respond. But then we realize that that may not really be the case because we haven't been discerning, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, in, our, in our process. And I think like a lot of young people also, like we do have a desire to serve, serve the church, but sometimes maybe we don't know like, you know, exactly how right, or in what way. Yeah. But I, yeah, but I think it's, it's great that we all have uh, this desire, right? And I think it starts with desire, right? And then after that, we turn it into action, intention. And then we are able to be of service, I think, uh, to the people around us. And I really like what you were mentioning about the local community, mm. right? Finding local solutions to the problems that are faced by the people, right? That we live with, that we live in the midst of. And that reminded me of the point that you brought up about the secular priesthood, mm. <laughs> like living in the world, like knowing the problems, like, you know, not shying away and, you know, kind of like, you know, like shielding our eyes and saying it's not there, but actually acknowledging the fact that, yes, there are these problems 
right, that are present in society, you know, in our own local society also as well. And, you know, actually working to address them, right, and actually serving them with love, right, not, not serving as, you know, oh, I'm just serving it and I'm, you know, being very, like, unhappy or, you know, having a grudge or something, but no, I'm actually serving them with genuine love for my fellow brother and sister, yeah, and I think that really, like, inspires me, I think, because uh, in Singapore, I think we also have, um, like, a Caritas, we also have the Caritas mm-hmm. Singapore over here, and we have, like, a young adults, right, community, right, about, you know, how we're going to uh, talk about, like, social justice, how are we going to help our local community, and I think that's a very good reminder also for a lot of us who are still discerning, like, our mission uh, at this point in time, because I think we, as you, I think based on, like, you know, like all of the, the sharing that you had, right? Like discernment is like this ongoing process. It's like you thought you had this idea, like you thought that, okay, this is where the spirit is leading me. And after that, he kind of like changes your direction or changes your perspective or trying to shifts you a little bit because you think, you're, oh, I'm going towards this direction. But then he gently like nudges you, like, you know, towards another direction, yeah. you know, in, 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 in the fact that, you know, he knows, um, what he has uh, in store for you and yeah. he knows how you will be used as his instrument. Yeah. Like, right? and, and, oh, and just God can work in such wonderful ways, can't he? And, and sometimes it just feels very much from inside as in just a, a desire or a passion or a, um, a sense that this is right for this moment. And, and, and other times, as you say, he, he just surprises us, you know, something happens and we didn't expect it. And it makes us think, in a completely new way, I think, but both of those things are possible. Um, it, it, well, we've got that phrase, haven't we? Carrot and stick. Some sometimes there's a carrot attracting us. Sometimes mm. there's a stick, as it were, kicking us into something. And and sometimes it's it's a very, as it were, subjective thing. You know, we just know that something is really important for us, and we feel like it says in the scripture, doesn't it? A fire burning within us. But other times, just something comes from outside um someone says to us why don't why don't you do this or will you help me do this or or there's a need um i remember a lovely thing that um it wasn't a christian thing this i was speaking to a life coach who was doing something with some of the students here so it was completely secular but she said when you're making decisions um, and discernment you want to think about these these three areas. It's like a triangle, a stool. Um, Passion, skill, and need. So what are your passions and interests and desires? That's great, think about them. But also what what are your skills and your gifts? What can you actually do or not do? And, And focus on the things that you're good at and the things you can contribute. But this is the interesting thing, need. Need is a criteria of discernment, she said. Again, it was secular. In other words, there's no point in having lots of passion and lots of gifts if there's no real need for what you're offering. So this is the outward looking thing of, of, again, the young Christian workers, the SVP, the listening, the auditing. What what is the real needs of, of my neighbor, of the community around me? Because if I've got nothing to offer, then, then it's just almost a hobby, you know? Whereas if my passion and gifts can meet the real needs of people around me, that's when you really see fruits. Um, and, and there's a wonderful coming together then, I think. So um, yeah, so lots, lots of, list, we're listening. God is speaking to us in so many different ways. And as long as we're trying to listen to him out there mm-hmm. and we're trying to have some time for prayer and and also we we're, we're, like we're doing now, Nicole, we're, talking to friends, we're bouncing ideas off other and getting advice from, from other wise people that we trust. I think if we're doing all these things, we can usually feel our way forward with God's help. Don't worry, Father Stephen, I just wanted it to end on your note because I think you ended very well. <laughs> okay. So that's why I had like a, a an awkward amount of silence. The I was like, okay, I'm gonna let Father Stephen because he's it's a very 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 nice way of. That's fine. Of, that's fine. So have we yeah, finished so the was, pod. Have we finished the podcast part? Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, that's great. So that's why I was just I was just silent. For a while. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm not saying goodbye, but just 
at the end of this record the video recording i'll okay I'll, oh I'll, no, yes. I'll, no I'll, I'll stop this in a minute i'll just to say to you okay. nicole thank you so much and it's been great to be oh. with you and and i'll stop the video oh. now but we'll, we'll, we'll okay. be chatting afterwards